a great pleasure to introduce our next uh, guest. Welcome, Gustav Metzger. Um, <laughs> Gustav Metzger is one of the only uh, guests of our marathon who has actually been here since the very first moment. So That's why, why they're applauding. <laughs> But um, I wanted to start with something else. We can come back to that later. Actually, the first time we met, uh, one of the first times was in uh, Cafe Cosmo, which uh, um, was a long conversation where you told me about your very, very long um, relation to, to London, about your arrival as a refugee, about your studies um, with David Bomberg. And I was wondering, because I think it would be externally interesting if you could tell us a little bit about how it all started in London about your beginnings in London, and mainly also about Bomberg. I thought it would be really interesting to hear about your... Well, my first contact with London was in a, in a bus coming from the coast where 500 refugee children, including my elder brother, Max Mendel, and myself, were traveling from Hook of Holland to Harwich. And uh, after a few weeks on the coast, we were transported into London. And the, my first uh, image of London is thousands of lights as we pass through the traffic, looking back onto this uh, array of traffic lights, which, of course, I'd never seen before, coming from relatively small town Nuremberg in Germany. Uh, and then the next... Uh, uh, strong memory which I may have told you about was that every Sunday we 20 refugee children were transported to the grandest cinema in London at the time Gaumon State, Kilburn, where we were given the best uh, balcony yes. se seating for nothing as a, as a gift so the, uh, these are the first memories and then at the, uh, some months after the end of the war we both came back to London started our studies in London which went on for seven or eight, eight years uh, if I went on more I don't think we'd, we could catch the time it would be good to hear more about Bomberg because we've heard a lot about um, uh, schools. schools we've heard about um, memory and uh, also about transmission and uh, it would be very interesting to hear about your teacher, Bomberg, and how this dialogue. Well, there again, let me start with the first impression. We had problems finding enough life classes to complete our study. So we had, in the end, my brother and I attend eight, four different classes, including one, I think, in Hammersmith. And we were told to go to the Borough Polytechnic as one other school where we, uh, the problem was heating the, the life classes at that t time of scarcity. So I remember walking into that uh, life room and there was a small man who, who looked very sort of unprepossessing uh, and uh, that was David Bomberg. But within a few weeks one realized this was not an ordinary person. He was charismatic. He, he had enormous experience and he was, I think, a great, great artist and he did his utmost to teach everyone, literally everyone in that 30, 40 uh, strong class, whatever was possible. So, and for years beyond uh, 1945, I would attend his classes. At the end, he had evening classes only, the last from 50 to 53, and I would live outside London much of the time and at night travel in just for the two hours study with him. So uh, I can't, you know, be more positive uh, on Bombeck than whatever I said. It wouldn't reach the, the level of significance he had for me and for so many others. Ren, do you? Um, if I may skip uh, a number of uh, phases, um, I understand that you were a kind of member of Fluxus. Were you officially a member of Fluxus or, or unofficially? Member of Fluxus. Were you a Fluxus? Fluxus. 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 
Well, uh, actually, that is a, a bit of a misunderstanding. Uh, the, 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 the essential facts are that in 1962, uh, the artist uh, uh, Spurry and Filiu uh, agreed to organize an exhibition in London. And this took place at Gallery One in, in the o autumn, well, in o October 19. 62, huh? and in that exhibition there, there was uh, Ben Wauthier, there was uh, Adi Köpke, there were a few, uh, and one uh, Robin Page. Uh, in the end there were, let's say, four or five people who would be in, going into Fluxus. Fluxus yeah. barely existed yeah. at that point, certainly not in England. Yeah. And so, uh, since I took part in the exhibition indirectly, and definitely took part in an evening at the ICA, where we were joined by Dick Higgins and his wife, Alison Nolan, who were absolutely, at that time, Fluxus. It is said that this evening was the first Fluxus event in England, and I think that's a very reasonable thing to say. Right. But beyond that, I never had any direct contact with either with Fluxus or with the participants mm. that, of that event. Yet what is interesting is that <coughs> you actually wrote your own manifestos, and this is something we've discussed a lot in previous interviews. Um, we're living now in a time where there are less kind of manifestos, and Raymond and I made this portrait of the metabolist movement in Japan, where we sort of investigated that sort of moment when in the world of architecture, there was still sort of a last moment of manifestos, but it was sort of, as the metabolist said in the 60s, a kind of a I irony or even a parody on the kind of earlier kind of 20th century manifestos. So I was wondering, uh, you have been influenced also by Wyndham Lewis, as you told me previously, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about these manifestos and uh, to which extent they were kind of related to an earlier 20th century notion of manifesto, such as Wyndham Lewis, or to which extent there was a difference? Well, both. The answer is this is the case, as you put it, uh, inevitably. And uh, uh, I, as I think I told you, I eagerly sought out uh, any avant-garde movement uh, going and studied it as a very young student and it must have influenced my later development and when it came to the point of me writing manifestos the first of which was in 19 uh, autumn 59 what and was the, the first manifesto you wrote it was the autumn of 59 uh, auto destructive yeah. art yeah. that and, was the beginning and that was the very first one. Yes, simply called Auto Destructive Art, which is November 1959. Maybe it's interesting to talk more about the city. One of the things this marathon tries to um, cope with is a kind of a impossibility of a, a portrait of London, yet we've had a lot of different point of views over the last um, 18 years. 17, 18 hours, and uh, we were wondering how you kind of see London now and uh, your kind of perspective on the city and how it changed in the sort of four or five decades. Well, it, it changed enormously. In, uh, when we came down, uh, I one evening walked from, late at night, walked uh, from uh, one of these big squares near Victoria all the way to um, the Brick Lane, where near where I lived, and it was just like walking in a village. Uh, this was in 19, uh, early 1946, I would say, in the winter. Uh, just the moonlight, whatever, and you just you saw. I don't remember seeing a car. Mm -hmm. uh, today with the night buses, yes, uh, and so th that's. I, I, let let me put it like that. This is the contrast. That's my early experience of London, which was very, very beautiful. The, even the, the bomb site had a certain beauty. And, and my brother and I worked at the John Cass Institute in Oldgate on, on, on a bomb site with carving bombed side stones. This was 40, 46, and for a couple of years we carved on that bomb site. 
Um, you, you attended this uh, pre presentation. Um, there is an enormous amount of uh, representation from the art world. Um, can you comment uh, on your closeness or distance from the artists you, you have heard this uh, day? Because if, if I try to imagine how somebody like you, who organized an art strike, uh, would look at the kind of current generations of artists, uh, I would like to know your closeness, your feeling of closeness or distance, yes, ca and can't. simply your comment. Yeah, yeah. well, th th that's difficult. Uh, there's now so much going on in this country, not only in London, uh, all over the country. There's a vast expansion of artistic uh, activity, manifestations, performances, exhibitions in places that spring up uh, every few weeks. And so to judge that is, yeah. is actually impossible for yeah. anybody, certainly for me. Uh, but a few general points. I do believe there is a, quite a lot of weakness when I go around some of the art school uh, uh, di diploma yeah. exhibitions. Uh, I, I see a lot of weakness and sort of playfulness, which does not in the least correspond to the reality of life either in this country or, or worldwide. And that is worrying, uh, extremely worrying, the tendency, boring, boring. the tendency to be light about the world, mm -hmm. which and cynical, ironical, mm -hmm. and uh, just not adequate yeah, to, to the challenge we are faced with. That's uh, one point, certainly of criticism, mm -hmm. I would make to quite a lot of the art, mm -hmm. not just among the art students, and graduates, but what, generally speaking, in the exhibitions mm. that are of younger people. One of the things which I thought would also be interesting to discuss is kind of your very unique positioning to the art world, because you have actually um, had an amazing influence on young artists over generations. However, you've always placed yourself very much in a, uh, a unique position in the art world, which is sort of very independent. Uh, also sort of not related to the art market. So I was wondering if you could also proclaim that there's a certain moment an art strike. So there has been a lot of resistance to the art world, also occasional disappearance from the art world. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this sort of your rapport, your kind of relation to the art world and how that sort of... Yeah, yes, uh, I think it's, it's necessary to uh, bring in the experiences uh, I had be before uh, becoming or trying to become an artist and that was an in intense involvement with rev revolutionary politics, uh, left-wing socialist, communist uh, ideas and ideals. This, I, this took place in my, uh, between the ages of 16 and 18 and uh, when I then came out of the idea of becoming a political animal. I chose to be a, a, an artist, I, I decided more or less. But I maintained my interest in politics uh, and in revolutionary politics and I still maintain that interest and it influences me constantly, this early uh, excitement and attachment. So that, that is the basis of the continuing criticism I have of art or, and of society. And if I could perhaps bring in some points that you mightn't ask me about. Yeah, absolutely, this is a very I've, good idea. <laughs> I've just made a couple of notes. That we are in the middle of a number of paradigm shifts concerned with consciousness and the difficulty uh, of going beyond where we are now in understanding our present situation. Uh, there is the, a gap, uh, an enormous gap between generations, uh, which has an uh, exponential aspects. Here, I think you'll agree, it, and, and by the way, all I am talking about is what I read in the media. I'm not a very clever man. I'm responding and quoting what I read in the media, and all this is in the media, in all the media. But let us spend a few minutes on, 
on the significance that you have the elder people who, who are not in touch with, with the actual experience. They, they cannot even get the experience. And so that's what I mean, the, the, the gap is exponential that every day the young and, and the very young are moving into uh, and the, the parents and the grandparents are not moving and so exponential gap. Now this is uh, v very important and it relates to the, the earlier point which is that I, I, I believe that the way we, I mean now in a broad sense we, look at reality is so limited uh, compared to the reality as it actually taking place, uh, uh, compared to the speed of the changes that are potential, that are happening, our ways of understanding simply are too slow and, and too, too limited. And uh, this is one of my great interests, and I think it's something that society, especially those as elements of society who, who desire change, of quality and significance need to constantly discuss and proceed to understand and, and, and communicate. And the other point I would make is that it is absolutely essential that people act. We have endless talks, and this is, I'm not criticizing what is happening here, I think it's, it's right that this has happened, but there is endless talk uh, among people in the media, what shall we do? And I believe unless some kind of action, literal action, takes place. Uh, it, it's just waste. It's waste of time. And I'm proposing an action to do with the art world, which is to introduce a campaign, a world campaign, on the slogan, uh, reduce art flights, reduce art flights. Uh, have I got it right? Well, along these lines. Yeah, that's right, reduce art flights. And I believe a good point would, to start would be the, the upcoming freeze. Uh, uh, we, what I'm saying is we as a kind of community can't just talk about the problems, but we have the opportunity and I believe the absolute necessity to act on what we know. And we can't go to Beirut and put ourselves physically between the combatants. We can go to Freeze Art Fair and, and to the Miami Art Fair and wherever there are these art fairs which all depend on flights, on art flights, uh, and say we want you to at least not to stop, you can't stop it, but reduce, just bring it down. And that is a campaign I hope to, to go on to and I hope it will meet with some kind of response in the worldwide art systems. It's very interesting because it's the third campaign we've had in this uh, marathon. It started all out with Eric Hobsbawm who said we should have a campaign and a protest against forgetting. Uh, we then had Gilbert and George who sort of pro uh, proclaimed a, c a campaign against Rucksack and now we have the campaign to reduce the art flight. So it's the third um, kind of campaign. And I wanted to ask you, um, in relation to Eric Hobsbawm, whom I know you appreciate very much, I yeah. um, wanted to ask you to maybe comment upon his campaign, his sort of suggestion that we should have a campaign against forgetting. So I was wondering how you would sort of talk about this necessity Hobsbawm sees in relation to the city to talk about memory. Yes, well, I, I, I'm increasingly concerned with these issues and my last works were on in that field the the room at cubit gallery was stating we must remember the 10,000 and more jewish particularly jewish intellectuals artists who were forced to flee and who were destroyed and and the second work uh, in memoriam uh, made for basel kunsthalle with Basel Kunsthalle early this year was all about the uh, recording the memory of millions of, of Jews destroyed. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, one direct line I'm working on as an artist in the past year or two, and I intend to continue in that direction. Many, many thanks, Gustav Metzger. Thank you. Thank you.